Hi there. Uh, in this video, we'll take a closer look at some of the tools we have available for us to um, analyze rotating bodies. So in particular, we'll take a look at Euler's equation for rotational motion, uh, where it comes from, and most importantly, how we can use it. So this is just a short video. It's not really intended to replace lecture material. Uh, rather, it's more to serve as a resource to refresh your memory on the origins of Euler's equations and the simplifications that can be made to it and how they can be done so. So having said that, uh, several important conceptual and intuitional concepts may not be covered in great detail here. Um, things such as the importance of selecting non-inertial reference frames or, or ensuring rotational symmetry of the body um, in order to uh, prevent the necessity to take the time derivatives of the inertial matrix, which can really uh, complicate things quite a bit. So to begin, we'll consider again Newton's second law, where the angular momentum can be written in terms of the inertia matrix times the angular velocity of the body. Okay, so uh, we get from here to here simply by uh, the der derivation is on page L1 of the handout. So we simply uh, expand this out, then we apply this uh, identity um, to get to here, and then once we expand these out with all the components, uh, we end up with this big mess of equations here. So it's basically just uh, some constant times omega x, and times omega y, times omega z, and so we can rearrange this into a matrix form uh, shown on the next page, and we end up with the inertia matrix times the angular velocities. Okay. So you can have a closer look at uh, page L1 of the reader if you want to uh, understand that a bit better. So now we can relate the uh, change in angular momentum to the uh, moments acting on the system by taking the time derivative uh, h dot is equal to the sum of the moments. Uh, and so if we allow our vector, um, our angular momentum vector to be defined in terms of some rotating coordinate frame, which is uh, actually very convenient for us to do, then the time derivative of h will be taken using the derivative operator for rotating coordinate frames that we studied uh, previously. Um, so that is the derivative of a vector defined in a rotating coordinate frame is equal to the derivative of that vector with respect to the coordinate frame plus the angle of velocity of that coordinate frame times, uh, uh, sorry, cross product with the angular momentum or the vector that you're differentiating. Okay, so uh, this is a general form of Euler's equation for rotational motion. Oops, so I've rewritten it here. Okay, so now uh, investigating each of these uh, terms just a little bit closer, uh, in a three-dimensional coordinate frame, uh, momentum, moments, uh, and angular velocity and everything can act in three dimensions. So each of these terms is a three-dimensional vector. Right, so it looks like this if you expand it out and show all of the components. Right, so expanding out the derivative term, we have um, three components of the time derivative of angular momentum with respect to the rotating coordinate frame, uh, plus the cross product of the uh, angular velocity of the coordinate frame um, and the angular momentum. Uh, and they equal to the uh, moments acting in that direction. So I've written here the cross product in terms of a matrix whose first row is the unit vectors, the second row is the first term in the cross product, and the third row is the um, second term in the cross product. Um, this is one of many ways to take a cross product. Uh, if you don't know how to take a cross product, then you need to contact a tutor sooner rather than later so that we can explain how to do this to you because it's uh, quite important to know how to take um, cross products. So after expanding out this cross product, we end up with uh, another form of Euler's equation. So this is exactly the same as before, only it's actually been um, expanded out. So recall now the meaning of these uh, angular momentums, hx, hy, and hz, are just the components of angular momentum given by the inertia matrix times the angular velocity of the body. Oops, shown right here. Okay, so uh, performing this matrix multiplication, oops, we can get this uh, big mess of uh, equations. So we got ixx times omega x, ixy times omega y, ixz times uh, omega z is equal to um, this row, and so on for the second and third row. 
Uh, so you can see if we substitute these back into Euler's equations, so hx back into uh, hx here and here, hy into hy, hy, uh, then we get this uh, nice complicated expression for relating the inertial terms and angular velocities uh, to the uh, moments acting on the system. Uh, so I won't bother to expand all these out here. Uh, in the real world, if we ever want to do calculations um, of this com complexity with this many terms, um, then it's going to be best to use a computer to make sure we don't make any silly arithmetic uh, mistakes. Uh, what we can do here is simplify our problem by assuming that the axes that we have selected are principal axes uh, and they do not change with time. So according to the principal axis theorem, um, this is a, a valid assumption to make because for every rigid body, there does exist a set of axes where the products of inertia go to zero. All right, so our, our inertia matrix will be diagonal and uh, now looks like this. Uh, it contains only moments of inertia and no products of inertia. And so our angular momentum simplify greatly down to this. So you can see now if we substitute these uh, hx equals this, hy equals that, hz equals that, um, back into here, um, then we're going to have a, a nice uh, a much more simple looking set of equations. So here we can see I uh, substituted them back in and we've got some uh, much more simple looking equations for relating the inertial terms and the angular velocities uh, to the moments acting on the system. Okay, uh, One simplification here that um, I've also made is I assume that IXX, IYY and IZZ do not vary with time and so I can write these um, dhx on dt, dhy on dt, dhz on dt, uh, simply as uh, simply has uh, ixx uh, omega x dot, okay? Because uh, we're simply differentiating this part here, and if we assume that i remains constant, then we just differentiate omega, um, and we can get the, these equations. Oops. Great. So uh, one last simplification uh, to consider is the case where the reference frame is actually attached to the body and spins with it. So in this case, uh, lowercase omega, oops, sorry, I'm off the screen. Lowercase omega is equal to uppercase omega, and so our, our equations simplify again much greater, much simpler to this. Um, so in this case, uh, all of the lowercase and uppercase ones are the same. Okay. So we can now apply these equations to analyze the spinning top example from the previous video. So recall we had somebody spinning at a constant angle of velocity lowercase omega about the lowercase z axis and this whole lowercase x, y, z axis was attached to the top and processing with it about the capital Z axis at an angle theta with angular velocity capital omega but not actually spinning around with the top. Uh, so here we can define the angular momentum of the spinning top as some vector inside of this rotating coordinate frame. So the goal here is going to be to find some quantitative relationship between the angular velocities and the moments acting on the system. So for this, of course, we can use Euler's equation. So we're going to want to find the angular momentum of the top, h. Um, so for this, we'll need to get the uh, inertia matrix times the total angular velocity of the top. Uh, and we're going to want to find the time derivative of the angular momentum inside the rotating coordinate frame and then we're going to want to find the cross product of the uh, angular velocity of the rotating coordinate frame and the angular momentum of the top. So the angular velocity of the spinning top in the rotating coordinate frame will look like this. Right, so because uh, lowercase z is always aligned with the axis of the spin, we've got uh, 0 in x, 0 in y, and omega z in z. Uh, the angular momentum, uh, sorry, the angular velocity of the rotating coordinate frame will look like this, where we need to remain consistent with the unit vectors that we use in our calculations. So uh, capital omega is defined in the um, capital uh, z axis, uh, so we need to decompose it into the uh, lowercase unit vectors. So we know theta, and we can just simply um, decompose it like that. And so the total angular velocity of the spinning top is going to be the angular velocity of the spinning top inside the rotating coordinate frame plus the angular velocity of the rotating coordinate frame. So I'm going to equal that. Now we'll consider what is the inertial matrix of the body. So the inertial matrix is going to be dependent on the selection of the coordinate frame uh, that we use. So what we've done is we've located the coordinate frame at 
the fixed point of rotation and we've aligned it with the principal axes such that we have rotational symmetry about the z-axis. So aligning this with the principal axes ensure that our moment of inertia, uh, sorry, our products of inertia will be zero, um, and we know that we can always find a principal axis. So this is a uh, valid assumption from the princ principal axis theorem, uh, and we need to have rotational symmetry about the z-axis here um, to ensure that ixx and izz, oh, sorry, ixx and iyy do not vary with time as the top rotates around uh, z the z-axis. Okay, uh, and finally, lo locating our coordinate system at a fixed point of rotation ensures that the uh, ensures that the problem is going to remain within the scope of this unit. So our inertia matrix will be constant and look like will be a diagonal matrix like this. Okay, so we've got no products of inertia because we are um, in pr principal axes. So now we have uh, everything that's required in Euler's equation and we can start to uh, use, use Euler's equation to analyse the system. Okay, so first we'll calculate the angular momentum H, which is simply uh, here the product of the inertia matrix and the total angular velocity of the body. Um, so that is going to equal... Oops. that is going to equal this, so um, Ixx times 0, uh, Iyy times omega sine theta, and Izz times uh, this term here. Right, and we've assumed uh, we have uh, constant inertial terms and constant angular velocities, so all of the derivatives uh, in the rotating coordinate frame will go to 0. And so we can easily now take the cross product of uh, angular velocity and angular momentum down here. Right, so again, I'll put it into the, de the determinant of this 3x3 um, three three matrix again, just like before. Uh, and taking the cross product, we get something that looks like this. And so, very quickly, we can observe that this, this, we can observe this peculiar gyroscopic motion in mathematics just as easy as we can in real life. We only had uh, angular momentum and, and velocities in the y and z direction, but according to the maths, uh, we only have moments in the x direction. Right, so we can clean this equation up a bit by taking out the common factors of uh, omega sine theta. Oops, sorry, that's here. Taking out the common factors of omega sine theta. And if we also take out the uh, omega z, then we can see that when the body is spinning much faster than it's possessing, uh, as is the case with the spinning top, then this second term here will go to zero because this is much greater than this. And we get a very simple equation for relating the uh, moment generated from a force procession or the moment required to maintain a force procession. Oh, sorry, that was just out of the screen. Right, so when this is much greater than this, this goes to zero and we end up with this uh, simple equation here. Okay, so I hope that uh, things up a bit. If not, send me an email so I can uh, fix it up. Thanks.